Okay. Well, welcome back everybody to day three. And it's a great pleasure to start with Jose Onuchik. Take it away. Okay. First of all, I want to apologize for not being person. I had some personal problems that made things very complicated, but I want to say happy birthday to Bill. And for you all young kids that have known Bill for a few times, you see how long we know each other. You see, we're giving up our age. You see, it is a PNS paper, 1988. That's the days that Bill was doing protein work. So that's the years we start to meet each other and uh, became good friends. And I just want to say that uh, it has been a terrific over 30 years relationship and uh, happy birthday. Welcome to the 60s. Uh, what I want to talk to you today is a little bit about uh, covariance. So one of the ideas when you have a funnel landscape is that when proteins fold, they tend to, just a second here, something here. When proteins fold, they tend to get more and more native-like as they become more structured. So as you can see from this photo relationship, you have a, a correlation between structure and energy as this, as, this ener as this proteins start to fold. And this idea tells you that a typical native interaction, a contact that exists on the final structure tends to be on average more attractive than a random contact as expected. So that's the idea of the funnel landscape. That's what creates the bias towards folding, that's what makes people to fold proteins in a successful way these days. Because of that, we create what we call these structural-based models for proteins, where we can find a lot of the mechanisms as long as we know the structure of the native structure. If I just have a structure of the native structure, I just create a potential that's attractive towards that native structure. And from these simulations, just knowing the structure, I can have an energy function that tells me a lot about function, about the transition states, about folding, a lot about proteins. And these models have been very successful in understand many biological processes, all the way from single proteins to molecular motors to large ribosomes. However, in order to do structural-based models and to do all these things, we have to have the structures. That's why basically predicting this, having this structure becomes a big problem. There's a very finite number of them that are available by, by experimental math. So people are becoming more and more on prediction on that. And basically alpha fold is creating one of the big things. Now, one thing that made alpha fold to be successful is the idea of covariance that we introduced on the early nineties. And that's what I want to tell you a little bit about it because an interesting story for physicists in the context of getting physics, a complete unrelated field and applied the field of proteins. So the idea of covariance comes that basically, although you have a certain number of structures, you have many, you have many more sequence that you have structural motifs. So here's, for example, a helix turn helix motif. And as you can see, appears in, a, in this evolutionary tree everywhere in the place. So it means there are many, many very different sequences that are able to fold towards the same structure. So with this idea in mind, we came with the idea of covariance. So if you have a native interaction into a protein, like for example, this one, you expect the interaction to be attractive. That means that if I mutate one particular amino acid, the second one has to also mutate it in order to compensate for that. And uh, by this compensation, you continue to be an attractive contact. So this idea tells you that we shouldn't follow just conservation of residue, but should look at covariance. You should see how pair of residues change together and how that idea, you can use sequence information to predict structural motifs. So the idea is, is very simple. So the idea now is if you have many sequences that folds towards the same structure, you just do sequence alignment of these sequences using your favorite method. There are many different methods that can do that. And with this method now, we can look what's conserved. So the first thing you do, you try to say for one particular position in sequence, what's the probability of having a certain amino acid at that position? 
And the second information you can get from the data is the is this pairwise probability that tells you if you look two positions on this case uh, here, for example, I look in position six and seventeen. I say, what's the probability of having two particular amino acids on, on at that position? So, for example, you're looking amino acids S and P position six and seventeen. If that's the case, you do two sixes. So it's a very simple counting. Basically, you're just doing counting, but it's very interesting that you just do counting on large numbers. The trouble is, if you think about this problem, what I'm just going to take the probability of one particular position and also just this pairwise probability, I can, but I don't want just this local probability. If I really want to be able to predict just, I want to get the global probability distribution. And this problem, I have a group here that's very literate in condensed matter physics. No, this problem can map into a POTS model, right? So basically here, it's a POTS model where you have the pairwise interaction, you have the field interaction or the magnetic field interaction that tells just come from PI and the covariance term that comes into that term. The difficult here is the inference model that comes into here. And what we do is we try to do maximum entropy here to try to predict the best global probability distribution can I do it. This inference problem can be very expensive. And when we start to work on this problem, that's what gives a lot of, a lot of, take a lot of computer time. But uh, I had two great postdocs that Farouk Marcus, that's now University of Texas, and Martin Waite, that's now in Paris. They figure out that if you get this POTS model, actually here, just for curiosity, this POTS model has 21 spins, right? Because you have 20 amino acids, plus you have a possibility of insertion and deletion. They figure out that basically, if you just do a mean field approximation to this problem, actually you can get these DIJs just by comparing, computing the inverse of this covariance matrix. So you can see at that point, the problem became made much easier and you could apply to many, many more systems. And this just became feasible. There are a few more sophisticated methods to get that, but I can tell you that this, what we call this mean field direct coupling analysis has been very, very successful and get on that. So after we have the global probability distribution, I can just now find what we call this DI that tells you what's the probability of that, pair, of that particular pair to be more likely, as you can see that this is just P log P. The only thing you're getting the direct information and just the real pairwise information that comes from the global probability distribution normalize the FIJs, and this, this, we use these things as a way of predicting positive contacts. So that really, really helped the idea on, on protein structural prediction because uh, you have additional information. Remember, mo most of the homology models, you're able to get uh, interactions for residues that are close to each other in the chain. This one gives a lot of information of long range contacts. I can tell you that basically alpha fold, that's one of the main things they help alpha fold. Based the difference between them and us, we just introduced the method. They, they spent uh, $4 million curating a database and they became much, it was actually a fantastic database, now publicly available of sequences that can be very, very useful. As you can imagine in the beginning, you have to start from having the sequence information in order to get this, info, this thing to be successful. So that tells you that all these methods that use these things are not going to be successful for a particular structure where the sequence information is restrictive. So with that in mind, this is a work that was done in the group basically on the early 90s that just get basically, here we look about 131 families where we test this idea. And for these 131 families, we figure out that basically you see from we figure out if the contacts predicted by DCA were correct contacts. And you can see this first peak here is direct contacts, since they're less than five angles from apart. That's why the residues are coming to the top of each other. You have the second peak around eight to nine angstrom, and these are contacts that are water separate. These are also correct. What's very interesting is this tail. As you can see, you come down, you come a little bit up. And people said, you're becoming very greedy about that tail. I will tell you that tail is actually very interesting. Say, why do you have contacts that are 20, 25 angstrom apart and still your direct coupling analysis, your 
variance, very strong signal. Your DI is still very large. And like I said, this approach is one of the main things in, the, in this sort of a alpha fold platform these days. So you can see the first thing here is just basically, here's a protein where you have a crystal structure. And uh, we can show that for these small proteins, if you know the secondary structure, you can pretty much predict the structure and the precision is smaller than one angstrom just by covariance. Uh, as you can see from this map, here's a contact map. The, the figure on the bottom tells you the, the X-ray contact map. The figure in the top tells you the red ones are the top, uh, are the, uh, all the contacts in, in red and green are the top DCA contacts. And you can see from here that you do very well on predict that structure. And even some of these wrong ones, they are very, very close, that the, the green ones, they are very, very close to the structure that you have. So this is a very powerful method on predict that structure. Uh, the second part is what I was telling you about this tail on this 31 family, it's what happens on those tails. And that's a very interesting thing. What we learn is you may have native contacts in proteins that basically don't have a strong covariance signal. It may happen because you don't have enough sequence, or if you have enough sequence, you have a conserved piece. It may not give you a signal. But what you, what's very odd is why do you have a strong value of contacts here, for example, particularly here, and appears to be a mistake? That doesn't make too much sense. So we start to investigate that. And here is just one of the cases where you observe that. Is a particular for this MTRC1 protein. And you can see that in a single protein, these contacts are very far from each other. But on the oligomer, when the two proteins come together, they are close to each other. So DCA predicts not only the, the structure of, uh, of uh, the native structure, but having a look at these tails, we can learn about contacts that are involved on multimeration or contacts that are formed during function and other interesting contacts that, that they exist. They may not exist on the single monomer native structures, but they exist like say multimerization or, or functional contacts or things like that. So with this method, we could now, now have some fun and uh, push this idea forward in terms of uh, applying this technique. And you can see here, here's a particular case where we, where we got this D ribose binding protein. And this protein as binds ribose, also the ribose is bound, but the middle has to go through a twist before it comes in and then goes back. We can observe that. That was a proposal that came from some experiments and from some NMR data. And we said, can we predict these things? And it's not, we predict, can the data, can the sequence data provide that information to us? So as you can see here, what we did here is we got, uh, we got the, we run, we just run DCA. And now here people had the crystal structure for the open structure and the closed structure of the ribose binding, they, but they didn't have any intermediate states. So what we did here, as you can see in blue is the open structure. These red contacts are the contacts that come on, on the closed structure. When we run DCA, we see that DCA is able to repeat most of this, has all the open, is able to repeat this context of the closed structure. You can see here on the red box, but you have a third box here that doesn't appear between the two structures. And when you get all these contacts, and trying to figure out what are the structures associated with it when we run, uh, when we run a structural based model where we put this context inside of the model, we now we run a simulation where the Hamiltonian is the open structure plus this context that come from covariance, you actually obtain three minima, an open one, a closed one, and this twist minima that people were talking about, and they just appear from here. Notice that basically this is not like we are doing a prediction. This is the data providing us with this information. So you're getting the sequence data and you are learning about uh, these additional structures. So basically this allows us to have a look and see when this bind is, you have to go through this twist state bind before you, for, you finally close the, into your system. So continue with these cool ideas of using these methods. We decide, can we apply these things to much more complex systems and larger systems? And that's what I want to 
have the opportunity to tell you a little bit about it on this final part of, uh, of this presentation. So for example, uh, here is one of the systems we have been working a lot, a lot is both this, this sort of histidine kinase response regulators that basically do all the control of uh, in most of the control into bacteria. And the question is, you have the sequences that are very, this structure very similar, but they are, they are able to do, diagnose these things. Can we predict this structure? This is the first work actually did, try to figure out the structure in, in Bacillus utilus. So in order to do that now, you have to play a trick. Now you have, you're trying to figure out the context between two proteins. So in order to do that, we have to create what we call this super proteins. That means we have to have the sequences, both of the first part, in this case here, like the histidine kinase and the other one, the response regulators. And I have to pair them together in the right order. In bacteria, this work is actually much easier because uh, uh, particular pairs are supposed to come together. They are on the same operon. So you know which are the pairs that you want to put together. Uh, when you go to eukaryotes, a little bit more complicated, we'll have time to tell you about it, but you create these super sequences, you align them, and you can start to get crystal structures. And you can see this is our first uh, paper by Alex Schub, that's now in Germany, that basically was able to predict the structure of this SP0B and, uh, and, and the OF complex regulator in Bacillus subitulus. And now people are doing much better, 2.5 to angstrom resolution on, this, on these big ones. So this one here is one of the cases that's very interesting because when you got the structure, you're not too happy about the method because it's just the first time we're doing it. We should have published before, but in the end, the crystal, the crystal structure and the theoretical paper were published on the same issue. We did it without the experiments, but we could, we could have it published a few months before. Tells you that sometimes you're trying to be careful. That's, it's always a tough call as, as we do these things in science but became a very good tool in order to predict protein, protein structures. Uh, one of the things that's becoming very, very common is actually to get structures of homodimers. As you know, homodimers exist in large quantities inside of your body. And now what you do is, if you have just the monomer, how you know the dimer is formed and you use that tail. Remember that tail that, that comes from it. We say, which contacts appear here they're not on the monomer, and I use them in order to bring the dimer together. And uh, we have many, many tools in order to utilize that information, that TAU information to predict uh, these dimers structures. Now, a very cool story that's more recent work is, can we do these things on much, much, much larger proteins, like these gigantic proteins, like this SMC, this structural maintenance, chromosome proteins like uh, cohesin, <coughs> and, and that basically uh, all these proteins that make loops into chromosome. These are gigantic proteins, uh, crystal structures that just exist for small pieces of this protein. Can we now use this method to try to predict the full structure of this thing? This work we did together with Dana Kropel, that's back in Israel, and Peter Wallens and his, some of his group, Nick Schaefer, have been working with us, and Aaron, that's run of these companies on structure prediction, and what used to be on the group, now it was one, one of the people together with Dana of doing most of the work here. So, so these proteins, SMC, like I said, condensing, cohesin, uh, they sort of bring two parts of DNA together and form that loops. And this is responsible for protein condensation. Remember when you have a large amount of this, pro of this protein, that's what you need, for example, condensing to go from the interface to mitosis, you need large amounts of condensing to do these things together. There's a lot of work on that. As you know, part of my group is working a lot on chromosome structure and dynamics these days. That's not a topic we're talking today, but this is one of the main proteins that are involved on this process of uh, loop formation into chromosomes. So again, we apply the same idea, but I wanna say what do we do here? When you look at this very large protein here, as you can see, you have these two SMCs, you have this dimer uh, that you have here. You have these other proteins, SSP, CSPCA, that make this sort of glycine. They're the proteins, that's the, that's the function, that's where the motor part, that's where phosphorylation take place. 
and they get together and we try to do structures. Crystallographers have been able to get little pieces of that. They're able to get a little bit of pieces of the hinge coming together. They're able to get pieces of this of these smaller proteins, SSPA, SSVB, these glycine proteins that they're functional proteins. And uh, what we did is now is, can we sort of complete this map using information from covariance? So we align these gigantic sequences, utilize covariance, and put these methods together. As you can see, the map fills up enormously. You can actually see these interactions, basically. You can see these herpines being formed, you see the interaction between the herpines, but more important, you have all these interactions coming back between these two parts. One of the most important parts here is the question that we, we understood that this interaction between SSPB and SPA, the one, bef the one before here, we were able to get the right stoichiometry that you had uh, two SSPB and one SSPA, and that's what you need in order to predict this map here. When you do the full, when you put this, this, this direct coupling analysis, covariance context, and do the full simulation into the system. What's very nice about it is that, like I told you, covariance can actually give lots more information just the structure. So the first thing we did, we were able to predict this proper stoichiometry. And as you can see here, this is a very gigantic protein. As you can see, it's about 40 nanometers. You see like a nucleosome is about 10 nanometers, just as a scale to measure here. This is very, very large. As you can see, in order to reproduce this interaction we got on the structure D here, you, you, you have here on the glycine part, on the active part, you have two SSPB and one SSPA, so you're able to find the right stoichiometry. So we figure out that this loop is not made by two rings, but actually one ring of proteins and three glycine proteins into, into that moment. Another, but another interesting thing is when we start to have a look here at the hinge. And when we start to have a look at the hinge, that's this part here. And as you can see, in orange is, the, is what you have, but you basically are able to reduce the X-ray structure that people have the hinge that's orange, but we have this purple box that's an addition. So you can see we are quite well for, with the crystal structure right over there, but you have this additional context. As you can see now, the method here tells me that actually what you have when you run the simulation, you have a closed structure, but you also have an open structure. So it looks like the hinge is able to open and close in order to allow DNA to come in. So now we can talk about functional abilities of the system to come together. And what's very cool is that you look this open structure a bit more carefully, you can see that you have the real charge mapping, the positive charge are mapping to the negative charge of the DNA. And that's how you may use it to pull the DNA in when these things attract it. So I know I'm getting close to my time. I don't want to go over time, but I want to show just a, I have a little bit, five minutes to finish, but I want to tell you that basically we did these things, mixing up force fields with the structural based models. We did for several proteins and uh, the method has been very successful doing that. But one of the interesting results is to show that, for example, these structures can actually live as clusters and they can move around and they can sort of uh, move around. And the idea that you have this cluster where you have, where you have twists, this sort of, this coil, coil, and this coil, coil, so you have a coil, coil of coil, coils, and you have these this many, many different isomers. And you see that you need them in order to reproduce some of the experimental data. A single structure doesn't have, that means this molecule, this motor is able to rotate things around. So that creates a very interesting possibility that I want to use in order to conclude here that basically the way these things work may be like Brady's in, term, in terms of moving the DNA around and not just like a handcuff. So this is one of the things we're exploring how the motor on these glycines come together and how these things move, move around. I had another topic I'm going to skip here. I want to stay on time and make sure I just want to thank everybody that participated in this work. And I think I just want to finish here first, congratulate you one more time. Uh, we did a lot of work on proteins on the old days. 
Uh, he sometimes flirts with a little bit of these days, but not as much as I would like to, but he has been doing great science. A pleasure to be here. Again, I want to apologize one more time for not being there present. Uh, and uh, happy birth, Bill. We have been together for over 30 years. Hope we can stay together for the same time. One more time. Let's see if we last that long, okay? Congratulations. Thank you very much. Questions? Uh, yeah, I think you need to lower the microphone. Oh, Jose will not hear you. Uh, can you hear me? Yeah, we can hear you. It's just so hey, that you hear Hey, Jose, how are you? I can hear you perfectly. Um, when you have these molecules that have alternative conformations and you see signals in the direct coupling analysis that are sort of contacts that are there in one structure but not the other, does that mean that in some way, if I really wanted to get the, the distribution of sequences right, I should have a mixture of two different POTS models? And can you, is there no. a sign, for example, in, if you look carefully, could you tell that the single POTS model doesn't fit as well because they're two different structures? That's a very good question. I would tell it goes the other way around. You have a single POTS model. The POTS model allows for the, just for the context, right? Now, when you build a structural-based model that you have the polymer plus the contacts that come from the POTS model, what tells you is not a single structure satisfied that, that, that ah, answer, right? Okay. Right, and now you get moved with, so the question is, so what you have to do now is you, you have one single POTS model, you maximize one single POTS model, but you say, can you satisfy that with a single structure or you need multiple structures? Now you go, and that's where we do the structural-based model simulations, and that's how it comes. Okay, great. Thanks. Okay. Uh, I, I just had a real basic question. How do you go from the contacts to the three-dimensional structure? What do you use? Basically, when we, when we do the typical structural-based models, we get, this, we get this structure, right? And you have a polymer models plus the contacts that come from the structure. We make them attractive, right? So what we do now is we generalize our structural-based models like I told you at the beginning, and I say contacts that are between residues that have a strong covariance signal, I put them as attractive. So I have an energy function where you add this context to the energy function, and now I run the simulation, see which structure do I get from there. Okay, thank you. So I put, just put this context uh, again into it, and then you can see if you generate one structure or multiple structures as you run those simulations. Mm -hmm. Okay, well, in the interest of time, let's thank Jose again and uh, move. So, okay, thanks again and for the invitation. Move on to our next speaker, Gaspard Kacik. All right. Uh, I'm just seeing. Good. Okay. So, um, thanks a lot for, uh, for organizing this beautiful meeting. Um, and um, it's uh, Bill, happy birthday. Uh, it's really nice to be here. Um, and I, I chose to present this work because in some sense, this is the work that uh, started a long time ago. You could say that this work also has some sort of a birthday. And I don't know, you know, whether we celebrate Bill 60 or 62nd for this one is also, I'm not completely sure if it is 15 years or 18 years since, since we thought about it and started this. Um, I'm sure the project would have gotten a driver's license already by now, uh, it's so old. So um, I should acknowledge uh, the contribution. So most, most of what I'll be talking about today um, was done by Thomas Okolowski, who I think is in the audience but there were a lot of contributions from other colleagues in, in this room. Um, and in particular, I would also like to thank uh, Thomas Greger because this was really um, to a large extent motivated and driven by the data on Drosophila that we've already heard uh, bits and pieces about. Uh, so let me see, all right. Um, so I'll start uh, with a few thoughts on, on optimization-based predictions and I'm sure Many of, of you in the room have been involved in this sort of intellectual tradition where we try to understand uh, biological complexity via optimization approaches. 
And the motivation for this mainly comes, of course, from the fact that living systems have evolved. And the, you know, the process of evolution itself can be seen as some sort of a, um, adaptation in a fitness landscape where, where kind of the, uh, the organisms get more and more adapted to their environmental niches. Now, the issue with this picture is that oftentimes making predictions from it is difficult because the map, the link between the genotype, uh, phenotype and fitness might be very complicated to state mathematically. So what we have done instead is find, in, you know, as a field, right, is to look for proxies um, for fitness that, that are more easily accessible mathematically. For instance, in the case of um, metabolic networks, one, one can think of um, uh, how the cell or how the fluxes through this network should be set such that the, uh, the time to make a new cell, a new bacterial cell is as short as possible. And this can be turned into an optimization problem that then predicts these fluxes in a cell which you can go and try to verify um, experimentally. And of course, there's many other examples. There can be examples of actual matter transport in organisms and how these matter transport networks are organized. Um, many of you uh, have been involved in efficient coding. So how efficiently to represent information in the ner nervous system so to maximize the, the amount at, at, the, at the constraint metabolic cost. And uh, what, what I'm going to be talking about today is, is um, optimization of information flows in, in uh, genetic regulatory or biochemical networks, if you will. Um, but what I would like to actually start with, I would like to make an excursion uh, to say that these approaches also have a, a difficult statistical side or a set of statistical challenges that are related to them, which, uh, you know, during the years I, would, I was engaged with, with, with these optimizations, um, kind of, you know, I was pushing under the rug and now we, 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 we try to bring them out um, and, and do some work on them. So this is just for an uh, advertisement, if you will. Um, so here are some of the questions that one is facing when one is making optimality predictions. So the first one is, if you have an optimality theory and you have some data, um, how do you make a, a rigorous, a statistically rigorous hypothesis test, whether that optimality theory is actually matching the data or not? This is perhaps not so easy. Oftentimes what we do is we make highly elaborate, and this is a beautiful computation paper by Cartlin and Simoncelli, predicting receptive field structures. So we might predict receptive fields of retinal ganglion cells from some pretty sophisticated model by optimization. And then you have stuff that's inferred from data. And you'd like to ask, you know, is, you know, is, this, is this prediction good? And oftentimes what we do in the end, we look at this, these things, maybe measure a few statistics and say, we are happy or we are not happy. So the question is how to make that more rigorous. The second set of questions is that maybe this is too restrictive. Maybe we should not be thinking of yes, no, is optimality there or not? Maybe we should be able to continuously quantify how close to optimality biological systems are. Maybe they're not at the peak for many, many reasons, right? But maybe they're close and that's still a you know, predictive principle. Um, <clears throat> You can ask whether optimization theories can aid model inference. So when we fit high dimensional things such as receptive fields, when we infer them from data, those are high dimensional objects that need to be regularized. Can we think of an optimization theory as helping that inference in some sense? And the last bit which, I'm, which will come up today in the second half of uh, my talk is can we use, you know, how, how do, if we have optimality theories that are high dimensional, uh, so where we need to optimize in high dimensional spaces, we might get degenerate predictions of those theories. Um, can we use the data to break these degeneracies? Um, or maybe set constraints. If you have worked on efficient coding, you optimize the information at some constraint firing rate of the neuron and so on. What if we don't, that constraint is empirical, right? What if we don't know it and we have to simultaneously infer it from data while we optimize other stuff? So how do we do these things? with some statistical rigor. Um, and I think this, some of these have been really limiting when you have optimization in, in, in complex high dimensional models. And I'm, showing, I'm going to show you an example of that. So here is, here is, um, here is our take on that. Um, so what we, what we wanted to do, uh, this is with colleagues in the group. Um, so we wanted to contrast you know, classical optimization theory uh, approach where you start with some model, um, maybe here a probabilistic model with parameters theta, you're given some utility function that's supposed to be optimized. You know, this is a notion of biological function. And then 
typically optimization means given the utility, you find parameters that optimize this function, the parameters of model that optimize this function. And I wanted to contrast this with the classical view of statistical inference, where you again have a model uh, with some parameters theta. You don't have any utility. So this is utility agnostic. It's very data driven, but you're given the data set. And of course the process of inference is now going from data again to the best set of parameters, but now the best means of course fitting the data. Okay, so in both cases, um, you know, you are making statements about parameters of, a, of the model, um, but usually these two things have been done, how to say, in, in separation, right? You do either one or the other, okay? Um, what, what we wanted to do is we wanted to see these two kind of two separate traditions as part of a spectrum. So again, normative theory optimality predictions are here where you're optimizing utility on this end, Data analysis, where you are making inferences from data are here. Both of these approaches make statements about, in this case, schematized some about the set of parameters. These parameters would best fit the data. These parameters would be optimizing for some function. And we wanted to come to the point where we can actually interpolate between these two regimes so in, in one statistical framework, okay? So you could think of cases where you are making predictions from optimality theory, but use a little bit of data to regularize those predictions. You can think of cases where you do inference from data and you use some of the optimality ideas to regularize your inference and anything in between. Okay, so um, if you're interested, you know, th this is uh, the, the reference. So how, how can, can one do it? So here is one slide on the key idea. It's a simple idea, but many of these statistical questions can then be worked out from there. So the idea is to do um, Bayesian statistics and actually to embody your optimality theory here, given by the utility function that you think the system is maximizing, to embody that into what we call the optimization prior. So it's essentially a maximum entropy prior with the hyperparameter beta, right? Um, and then of course, this is the term from the theory, which you then put together with the likelihood term that you, that you, it's the standard likelihood term for fitting to construct your posterior. So this is now a distribution over parameters, given some data, given some optimality theory, and this hyperparameter that basically controls how much of the posterior is dominated by, by your priors versus by, uh, by the data term. And so now you can think of that spectrum that I showed before, uh, really realized here, and the spectrum is accessed through this beta, where strong beta, you know, biases you towards solutions driven by the theory alone. And this actually corresponds in some sense to the low data limit where this term is negligible or vice versa, weak beta, where you mainly do statistical inference with not much influence of, of the optimality prior. Um, and, you know, just to say, this is a very different type of use of priors than your usual statistical regularizers, right? We just shrink the parameters to zero. Um, so in this, in this piece of work that I'll, I'll try to present, uh, we'll use a little idea from here uh, to try to break the degeneracy of optimality predictions as you will see. So let me now switch gears and, and, and talk about deriving, um, trying to derive a, a, a a biological network from an optimization principle. So what, you know, we, we have spent quite a lot of time in, in the group trying to think about flows of information in biology. Um, and of course, the, the word information has been is mentioned explicitly in various key pieces of biology, definitely in central dogma of molecular biology, but also very early on um, in evolution or from the side from Kimura's paper, uh, you know, genetic information is increased in the course of progressive evolution. So you might want to know how to formalize this notion. Um, efficient coding hypothesis are also already mentioned. Um, and what we'll focus on today is this particular application of informational ideas to developmental patterning. Going back to Walpert, uh, you know, this is the title, positional information and the spatial pattern of cellular differentiation, right? So this is 1969. So what is meant by this positional information? Um, it's essentially uh, a concept. It's one of the ways to figure out how cells can figure out and share the identical genetic material in a multicell organism, how to take on the appropriate cell fates for their positions in, in the body, right? So how to specify the body plan. And 
you know, core proposals are not very different from this engineering version of the problem where you have to figure out on earth where you are by triangulating from radio signals that you get from the satellite and the equivalent, um, in, equivalent idea in early patterning is that instead of radio signals, you have chemical signals. So this is this famous French flag idea where this is the body coordinate, only 1D in this case, in the simple model. This is now a chemical gradient, a morphogen gradient, and then cells can essentially learn where they are by reading out these local concentrations of morphogen gradients and then take on the appropriate cell fates. Um, and the concept has been that these gradients encode positional information and you know, the cells are reading it out. And what we, one of the questions that was really driving me was to understand you know, what kind of profiles, spatial profiles, would provide the maximum amount of positional information. What would be a good chemical GPS if you want? And you know, this appears very simple, one profile with thresholds, but how would you do it if there are multiple profiles that are non-monotonic, they are noisy, et cetera, right? So what would, would, there, what, what would be the theory of reading out information you know, from multiple satellites with different noise properties, if you will? <clears throat> So uh, this, is, this has been now shown by, by, by multiple people. So here is my short slide on, on the early events in the, in the fly patterning. Um, so what, what we are interested in is this stage that also Thomas was introducing, that is slight of, of fly developments with fly embryo with cells on the surface, which is just slightly preceding the first morphological events like the invagination of, uh, uh, of cephalic furrow here. Um, so genetically identical cells, then something has to happen reproducibly, which is this invagination. And the basis for that reproducible morphological event um, is if you were to look into the cells are patterns of gene expression that are very precisely spatially defined. So morphogen, primary morphogen gradients, which then drive what is known as a network of gap genes. And then this drives the famous uh, seven stripe genes that can then specify uh, precisely the various positions, right? And so what we, what we wanted to know is we wanted to take measurements of these patterns. We'll particularly look at the gap genes and ask how much position information do they really encode and which patterns are good at encoding that information. Okay, so gap gene layer. So here it is. Um, so this, this is now um, a, again, a, a fly embryo. Uh, it's about 30 to 40 minutes into nuclear cycle 14. You can look at the pattern of four gap genes as a function of space from anterior to posterior. Uh, they are shown here. This is data from uh, Thomas's group. Oh, actually the reference, I'm sorry, is below, but it's, be it, it's, it's below this. Um, so Knurps, Scrupel, Giant, and Hunchback, and their sort of embryo to embryo variability sort of due to noise is, is, is also plotted. Um, and what we would like, you know, what the key idea uh, was here to quantify is to really see the combinatorial set of four concentrations here, for instance, Krupel zero, Knurp zero, giant something, you know, intermediate and high hunchback to see this as a code for a particular position in the embryo, in this case, 0 0.3. And of course, at some other location, there would be some other set of concentrations. And what you have to understand here is really that you know, these are means over the embryos, but what cells really have access to is noisy versions, right? Individual, individual kind of draws from, from, from this uh, kind of noisy concentration profiles, right? And so you, know, you can do this across positions and therefore suggest that the biological concept of position information can be identified as a, now a mathematical concept from information theory, which is the mutual information between these four concentrations and physical position X. And this is something that can be estimated from data uh, as, 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 you, as you're all aware. And if you do that, you learn many interesting things. So first of all, you learn that each individual profile encodes close to two bits of information, not, not one bit, which might, you might expect based on previous discussions that let's say Hunchback is really making, the only thing that's making is kind of a sharp boundary between an on and off domain. And it's true also for other gap genes that they encode substantially more than one bit of information. Uh, so they're not, you know, binary switches alone. Uh, together, all four of them combinatorial encode 4.3 bits. So you see there is quite a lot of redundancy. It's not four times two, which would be eight. So these patterns are, are quite highly redundant. 
you can then interpret these 4.3 bits in terms of an equivalent positional error. So 4.3 bits is sufficient to specify every position in the embryo with a precision that's uh, uh, 1.5%, which is, as Thomas was saying, is, is roughly one nuclear uh, diameter along the long axis of the egg, right? And so this, this precision at the gap gene level is also equivalent to the precision then of the downstream markers of the seven stripe genes and of the cephalic, cephalic furrow, how peaks and troughs of those genes are, are positioned. <clears throat> Right. Um, one interesting thing is that this positional error um, is nearly uniform along these axes. That, that's a very, so wherever you are, you actually can tell where you are with a, roughly the same precision, which would be, you know, that's how you design the, the GPS, right? Not to specify some positions very precisely and some less precisely. And we interpreted this in our early work with Bill as an, one empirical signature that this encoding of information might be optimal. Right, this uniformity of, of positional error. All right, so now I'll, I'll turn this on the head and try to do this. So instead of empirically estimating positional information, let's assume it's optimized. Let's assume the position information is maximized and let's try to derive the gap gene network and expression patterns. So, um, so this is where Thomas Sokolowski uh, carefully constructed a, a, a pretty elaborate spatial stochastic dynamical systems model of this patterning. Um, basically, we took three maternal morphogen gradients as fixed. We said there were four gap genes uh, that can interact in every cell via some genetic regulatory network, right? This is along the x-axis in every nucleus. Um, there was, you know, a bunch of processes that were being modeled, um, including the diffusion of gap gene products, nuclear division, and so on. And the idea was to, you know, once you construct this semi-mechanistic or quite mechanistic model, the idea was not to fit it to data, but to optimize its parameters such that position information that it gives would be maximized, right? To use it as a predictive principle. Um, so I have a slide on, on details of this model, if, if, if anyone is interested. So the key thing again are these three anterior morphogen gradient, posterior and terminal system this is given. These are the three morphogens. There is a network of four, of four gap genes that are interacting and you parameterize all these interactions through a biophysical model. So you write down differential equation for the expression of all gap genes in all of these positions along the AP axis, a production term, there is a decay term, a diffusion term, and you model the noise. So the stochasticity in gene expression, okay, in, in quite a detailed model. Um, and then the re regulation function, so the production function is of course the thing that's, that sums, that tells you how this gap gene responds to the three morphogen and how it cross-regulates with other gap genes and how much self-activation or self-repression it has. And again, you know, the number of parameters is the, in this model is large because you need, you know, two parameters for all of these arrows and you keep them as three parameters. These are the things we'll optimize for positional information. All right, so try to predict the interaction parameters and the topology. Okay, um, as, as a side, so it's a large scale optimization in high dimensional parameter space. Um, so, how do we even, if there is multiple solutions, how do we even know that there would be a solution that's close to the data? And here is where the connection to my uh, first bit comes in. What you do is you play with these two terms, the optimization term and the fitting term with the beta parameter that you have, uh, right? So this is exactly as in the first half, it's the log of the, of the posterior. Um, and by changing the beta, you can access different regimes. First, you can make this term dominant and you can just try to fit the data to see that you can actually reproduce the data in your model, right? Then you make beta large and you're doing optimization while being slightly pulled towards the data to find if there is an optimal solution close to it. And if you find it, you kill the fitting term and just check whether the solution that you actually found is a maximum of the information. Right, so to, to really ver verify that you know, the solution close to the data is indeed an, an extremum of your, uh, of your information function. So this is, this is the basic idea. And so let's see how it works. So this is a particular 
optimization run. So we start with some random parameters here. This is optimization steps, and this is the information we are trying to maximize, stochastic optimization. So this random initial point, you just see some flat profiles. Of course, nothing interesting happens, but as optimization progresses, you're making more and more complicated spatial patterns until at the end here, you end up with an optimal solution that I'm showing with about 4.2 bits of information that you can compare to the measured gap gene profiles, which are slightly more complex and we cannot access all of this complexity in our model, like this linear ramp and the double peak, but all in all, the agreement between these two is very good. And actually also the amount of encoded information is extremely close. Um, this does not need to be actually. So information maximizing solution does exist close to the wild type pattern. And as I said, we can, we can rationalize the mismatches. Um, we can even, I mean, it, it's, this is mechanistic model. So we can really, you know, we are predicting also the, the variability in the pattern and we can try to take it apart and say, you know, it's, it has been a big question in developmental biology, which mechanisms contribute to getting this precise uh, patterning, you know, temporal averaging, spatial averaging by diffusion and so on. You can take that apart. I don't have the time to go into this. Um, and again, Unlike in fitting, the function that you optimize is actually a separate phenotype. This information is something you can estimate, right? It's not just a fitting function. You can estimate it on real data and it has an interpretation in terms of patterning precision. All right, I'll skip this bit. All right, so you can then open the box of the model that you optimized um, and try to also compare, right? Because we were optimizing all the interaction parameters you can try to see whether we recapitulated the network of interaction that has been really worked out through genetics slowly. And this is one, uh, one schematic from uh, Yogi Yeager's paper that summarizes the known interactions. So strong mutual repression between these two pairs of genes, weak repressions here and auto activation on, on these genes. So if you look at the optimal solution that we found, it's not exactly the same, but it definitely recapitulates this strong mutual repression a number of these weak arrows, it puts auto activation not exactly on the same nodes, um, but you know, it, it, it's almost there in many ways. Now, is this prediction unique? It's not. Uh, this optimization problem is degenerate. It has many solutions that, you know, here they're shown on the, as a function of the mutual information achieved. So if you look, there is many dots here. Each one is an optimal solution. Um, they all achieve roughly the same information, you know, about 4.3 bits is the median and they, it doesn't go up above five bits and so on, but they all cluster here. And this is a random ensemble where you just pick parameters at random of this mechanistic model, right? So it's right there. And you can ask, do these optimal solutions share other properties? Right? Indeed, all of them have small positional error. They almost should have. So they're good in patterning compared to random, especially. They all create many slopes where gene expression profiles go from high to low or from low to high. So 11 slopes is the median um, because that's where encoding of, informa of information really comes from. And they, the coefficient of variation of how much resource is invested in each gene is pretty low. So the genes equally distribute their resource, how much gene expression do in each of the four gap genes. Um, so you uniformly distribute the resources across these gap genes. An interesting observation is also that if you look at just these optimal solutions, the solutions that really have high information even with this, within this optimal group, are typically temporally stable solutions. We haven't put that into the optimization, right? So these are the solutions with high information have lower time derivatives. So they, they reach this stable, stable, stable state. All right, I see that Alex is already there. Let me see. All right, I'm, I'll be wrapping up. Um, let, me, let me do one more, uh, let me make one more comment. We can now really explore the space of different models where we pick random parameters for my interaction network. And for each set of these random parameters, I put a dot in this plane that shows how much information I can achieve with those random parameters and how much gene expression is needed, right? So if you want the metabolic cost of making that pattern, and you see this very, very elaborate structure here that can be rationalized. 
Um, so this provides the null expectation, right? This is a sort of a random ensemble onto which now I can put optimal solutions. So if I now ask, please generate, please maximize the information while keeping the resource cost, the amount of expression, the same as in the fruit fly, this is how far I can take my solutions out from the, from the optimal ensemble, right? And I can kind of say, even if there was no resource cost constraint, what's the best you could do? And you don't get much further out. So these are the solutions where you don't impose any resource limit. And then of course you can squeeze the resource limit down, right? So you can make a plot, how much position information can I get as a function of resource cost? You will see that this increases up to the wild type, which is pretty cheap. But then even if I release the cost constraint, you do not get above the five bits of information, which we also find as interesting, right? So mechanistic constraints limit you to five bits or below. And the wild type like solutions can achieve almost as high information, but at a much smaller cost. All right, let me skip this one slide. So then it's interesting, but I'm not too late. And then I'll wrap up. Okay. So um, I, would, I would like to make this very tentative connection to optimization from this optimization principle to actually evolutionary adaptation. Um, so it's tentative because numerical optimization is, of course, not evolutionary adaptation, but I think it may reveal limits and trade-offs that also the evolutionary adaptation might be subject to. Um, and I think this is interesting because, you know, trying to make this precise really requires you to trade off quantitative things. You have resources, you have information. You know, you cannot just make up a story and saying this is optimized and I forgot about the other thing, right? You have to quantitatively try to pull out those kinds of trade-offs <clears throat> that I was trying to uh, illustrate on, on the previous slide. Um, I think there are also very interesting formal links to evolutionary theory. You have made first steps uh, with, with Nick Barton in that direction. In particular, if you consider random ensembles, so these are ensembles where you could see selection has not yet acted to optimize for a function an optimal ensemble, which is what's achievable given biophysics, and then try to position the wild type somewhere on this axis and ask how much information did evolution need to accumulate to move from some starting position here and to maintain this particular wild type phenotype, right? And how much information would be needed in the genome now, not as position information, to push it to the optimum. Um, I think there is much work to be done there. Um, there are, you know, I showed you that the problem is degenerate. There is other optimal solutions. One looks like Drosophila melanogaster. Do the others look like fly relative species? Um, it's an interesting question. I do not have the answer to that. And the last bit, uh, let me just say that this opens, optimization opens the door to explore evolutionary necessity and sufficiency, at least in the model. Right, so genetic sufficiency or, 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 or necessity means you knock out a gene and the thing dies or not, right? But of course here it's different. You take out, what we can do is we can take out one gap gene. So say the fly only had three and re-optimize the whole system, right? And you can ask, could the patterning be done with three gap genes if you readjust everything else? Or, or you know, is the fourth one really necessary? Are the three morphogens really necessary? Or what would you lose even if you could readjust everything else? So I don't have time to show this, but this is a really interesting game to play. And it is, you know, very hard to guess the answers to this, uh, these questions. You can rationalize back once you see what the answer is. It's very hard to guess for up front. All right, so perspectives. Um, I think this was a story of trying to take a biological concept that was there in the field from 1969 and make it into a mechanism independent mathematical quantity uh, that can really be estimated from data. Um, and we in our group are spending time trying to find other such cases where you, other such concepts when this can be done. You can then elevate the same quantity, this position information to a utility function of an optimization problem um, for spatial patterning. And you can try to make first principles predictions in, in, in a really complex mechanistic model. And, and lastly, and this is sort of call to action, I think, yeah. You know, we need to develop further statistical language to deal with the results of such large scale optimization problems. Um, how do we deal with the degeneracy of optimality predictions? You know, how can we identify relevant utility and loss functions and constraints if we believe optimization is going on? Can we infer them from data? 
Um, so there is many other such questions here um, that you know I invite you all to think about. And with that, um, thank you. Uh, and if there is a time for a question or two, I'm happy to take them. Hello. Good morning. So it was a very provocative talk. I had a bit of a comment and, and, uh, and a concern. I wonder how you'd address it, which is about the utility in general of optimality theories, uh, uh, particularly with regard to your last slide. This is a product of evolution. Evolution doesn't seek to optimize. Evolution seeks to have a just so solution, which works. So there's no a priori reason why something would necessarily be optimized, although in a few fortuitous cases, it has turned out that things are very close to physical optimums. But we're, there's, there's certainly no guarantee of that. And the other thing is that we don't know in these optimizations what is being optimized. My nose, for example, might be optimized for breathing. It might be optimized for olfaction or sexual attractiveness. Um, any of these any of these constraints um, uh, would very much change the outcome of an attempt at optimization. Since you don't know the parameters to optimize with respect to going in, since you don't know that the nature solution would be optimal, and since, as you pointed out, a lot of the optimal solutions are degenerate anyway, where does that leave you? Yeah, so I think that is, so the, the questions that you are asking are precisely the questions I've been asking. That's why we spend that first part trying to figure out. So I think, I would not say it's so bleak, right? I'm very interested, for instance, in, you know, if I were to change my utility function, also for this case, that's something we would like to try um, instead of maximizing position information to try to, you know, maximize or try to ask, you know, I assume that at every position I need to make the minimal error, right? So, you know, which of these solutions are the solutions to both optimization problems? Do they share common statistical characteristics, right? So the number of slopes and so on. So I think that's one way to progress step by step. The other, I think, is really, you know, it's really this thing. We need to, I think we need to depart a bit from this point optimal solutions, right? To run the optimization you find is the best thing, right? And really look at the shape of the utility. There might be many, many solutions that are close by, slightly less good, but, you know, do they share, do they explain the data all, also as well, right? This would be, this would really increase the sort of robustness, right? Well, true, but of course, if the more degenerate the solution is, the more the less predictability you have because you don't know which one of the many possibilities that are suboptimal is actually the one that nature has chosen, and then maybe nature has yeah. chosen them all in different instances. Yes. <laughs> yeah. So, all right. So, I'm happy to talk to you about this, right? Okay. Do you don't want to let Daniel talk? I think I'd like to hear from Daniel. So just the, the, the quick comment, I actually think the situation is sort of worse than that, right? Because evolution works in a very high dimensional space, even just for a simple cell, just from all the molecular stuff going on. And, you know, the, to the extent that we understand the evolution or anything in going on in high, very high dimensional spaces, there may be very many maxima, which you would think are different optima, but they're not very relevant. It just keeps wandering around saddles. And it's not, it doesn't sort of really get to or commit to any of the maxima. So I think that, you know, in some ways makes it more complicated there are probably particular things that end up getting close to to optimize but then one also has to sort of think about the the evolutionary process that gets to those because that's our only occam's razor really right is that it's something has to evolve and then it can appear to be optimizing certain things but actually wow. came from something different no that's that's the function we have to understand how it got there Right. So no, our understanding is so good that we know that it's not that it's not predictable even on very simple things. And when you think you're optimizing something in the lab, no, but there's two things: there's taking an organism and then arguing something about it's most optimal, and then there's actually looking at how the evolution proceeds. 
and whether evolution proceeds in a way that one optimizes something that one thinks one might be optimized. But I agree with you 100%. I think the first step is to do, you know, is to postulate the principle, try to derive, see whether it recapitulates the data. And then the second one is to discuss, you know, if that's an extreme, how would evolution take you there? If it, you know, or it, would it take, yeah. right? Yeah, yeah. All right. <laughs> Thank you. Sorry, can I ask a very pedestrian question rather than yes. a philosophical question? Um, in all of this cluster of maximizers or near maximizers of the mutual information, do these also tend to share the special property that the implied relative error is uniform across the interval? Uh, among the, opt yes, they, they do that. And I, I should say that a lot of the patterns, a lot of the optimality predictions are, you know, if you want, if you visualize them, right? they are actually very close to the wildcard. They don't, you know, there is some degeneracy about how exactly you shift the borders, but this general like progression of domains and so on is, is something that you get out, you know, also in these other solutions that you find that are local extrema. Thanks. Yep. So somebody else has a question and just back down. Just stand up and ask this question. I But I guess I was wondering, like more concretely, if you have examples where you have tried optimizing multiple things and finding like, oh, this is not optimized in this situation. This is not optimized. Oh, but like we found the thing that is optimized. And then, you know, maybe like once you have kind of like examples that are both kind of like not true and true, then you can start talking about like you know, what are the dynamical ways in which this came about versus what are the ways in which this doesn't come about? Or maybe like, what are the constraints that are governing this? So we haven't done it in this system just because it's numerically too costly to play this game. But of course, in, in efficient coding with receptive fields, we have been playing this, right? And also, you know, different objective functions to in, to in many cases actually lead, lead, to, lead to almost indistinguishable predictions there, right? So there is some robustness and what you choose for, for the utility to optimize in that case. Yeah. Of course, you can choose utilities where you get something completely different. So that yeah. exists as well, just to not make that mistake. Yeah. All right, thanks for again. Yes, thank you. Yes, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, good morning, everybody. It's a great pleasure for me to be here and to uh, help Bill celebrate his 60 plus birthday. <laughs> um, um, this talk will be, I think, different in character from most of the others that you've heard. Uh, I'm not gonna talk about whatever latest and greatest I might be doing. I wanted to do a little bit of intellectual archeology span and go back in time and revisit um, why I owe so much to Bill in, um, in intellectual terms. So. Uh, just to set the stage, Bill was my tour guide and mentor when I decided a while back to leave my home world of high energy physics and quantum field theory to see what a theoretical physicist could usefully do in the world of biology. And I soon learned that a key tenet of Bill's worldview was, that the, uh, was the role of probability distributions in understanding biological systems. And we explored a few example cases in my sort of decade long post postdoc, right? I mean, I was already uh, a fully accomplished scientist in one world, but I wanted to go into a different world where I really didn't know much of anything. And I made the good choice of uh, working with Bill and um, just took me a long time to get, uh, to get my first academic job in the, in the new world. So I had a long post postdoc with Bill. Okay. so. Um, what I think I would like to say is that um, most of what I know about how to do theory in biology uh, came from Bill. And we worked on three broad projects over the years that actually led to papers. And I'll, I'll mention them. The first, uh, this was the outcome of a sabbatical that I took back in the mid 90s um, when Bill was at uh, NEC in Princeton. And I tracked over to his office once once a week, I think. And, you know, first we just sort of thrashed around. What, what is it that we're talking about? And eventually he was trying to 
he was trying to think of, well, what could a guy who knows quantum field theory uh, bring to what I'm interested in? And we eventually uh, came up with something called field theories for learning probability distributions. And that was a paper with Bill and, and Steve Strong. And I will not talk about it here because uh, there's just not enough time. And on the other hand, it was kind of interesting. I think it was, it was an interesting idea that has been developed a little bit by uh, people from then on, uh, but not much. I would say it was not a, not a, a, ro a roaring hit, but it was a lot of fun for, for me at any rate. Uh, then uh, I didn't know what Gasper was going to talk about, but the, uh, the second paper was a collaboration with Bill and Gasper. And I remember the, it was called Information Flow and Optimization and Transcriptional Regulation. And uh, Gasper has stolen 99.9% .9 of whatever thunder I might have been able to e emit on, on this particular paper. Although I'll describe it as uh, we lived it at the time. Uh, and I think the, so this is kind of the prequel version of uh, Gasper's talk. <laughs> <laughs> the Star Wars, the prequel. It's what this idea uh, could came to when it grew up, and uh, I, I knew it in a in a very uh, nascent and embryonic stage, as it were. Ha ha. And then the, the third one was maximum maximum entropy models for antibody diversity, which uh, was work we did, Bill and I, with uh, uh, Alexandra Walchek and Thierry Moha. And that also grew up into something else. And I'll talk briefly about how it grew up. Uh, the, the core theme in these three papers is that most biological entities are a draw from a complicated non-Gaussian high dimensional probability distribution. You know, it's kind of, we are all human beings, but we are not on a, not built on a um, uh, Mercedes, uh, automobile body plan. We come with all kinds of shapes and sizes and cells gather themselves together. No cell, even though gen genetically identical with its neighbors is um, physically identical. We live in some kind of uh, complicated to describe um, distribution of properties. And our problem as theorists is to figure out how to characterize these probability distri distributions and learn them from data, the problem that Gasper was just talking about. We don't have a general theory, so we struggle with particular systems and try to draw general les lessons. And if we're extremely unwise, we try to draw lessons about uh, evolution, <laughs> which continues to be very, very elusive. And I remember with pleasure, um, Gasper and uh, Justin Kinney were graduate students at the same time. And, you know, the three or three plus two of us were hanging about in uh, our respective offices and discussing precisely the questions that Gasper was talking about today. And, you know, many of the basic ideas of how you go about this problem uh, were in embryonic form kicked around then. So I'll tell you in some detail about the second and third projects uh, since they're particularly instructive and time is short. Okay, so let's see, how do, I, how do I evolve the screen? That's an interesting question. Oh, okay, just clicking does it. Well, after all the stuff you've heard, you don't have to have a, nobody needs a lightning review of gene regulation. Uh, Goen in her instructions to the speaker said, well, you know, imagine you're talking to an audience of first year graduate students in physics. Well, okay, for them, you have to say something about how gene regulation works. And the only thing to remember, or the thing that's most important here is, okay, so somehow Thomas's name is, is lost from the, the slide. But anyway, the, um, the, the thing that drove what happened next was, the measurements that Thomas Greger had made in the fly embryo of the relation between input concentration of bicoid and output the concentration of hunchback in the thousands and thousands of nuclei that are present in the uh, an appropriate stage of the development of the embryo. And, you know, the key point is that input output is a noisy relation, but it's a relation that has a statistical uh, description. And this, is, this picture has already been shown. It's uh, 
kind of uh, daunting to see all of these nuclei. What's even more daunting is to watch the, the dynamics when this fold begins to form and the, the real development uh, takes place. But anyway, this is all known to you. Uh, there's a primary decision that's made. Gasper was talking about the whole set of decisions, all, you know, all gaps, all gap genes having done all of their work. The very first thing that happens, as he explained, and Thomas told us in great detail, no doubt, uh, is the uh, turning on of hunchback in the, the part of the embryo, the very first step in the part of the embryo where bicoid, the stuff laid down by the mother, is sufficiently high. All right, so, um, and there's this business of somehow uh, the location of this transition is very, very precisely determined. And how does this all work when you have noisy inputs and noisy outputs and so on? And so the measurement of tens of thousands of nuclei uh, done by uh, Thomas for his uh, PhD work, which has developed into a, an enormously important industry in the understanding of gene regulation, uh, you know, these two pictures here, I don't know if you can see the pointer, uh, give you the, the noisiness of the input-output relationship and the, the way the variance in the output uh, depends on the value of the input, appropriate, appropriately normalized. Okay, so um, we had uh, integrated all of this into our worldview, and the question is what to do about it. So uh, Bill uh, basically uh, convinced us that the thing to do was to try a variational principle. And so the, I, and of course, information, mutual information was a concept that he introduced me to at any rate. And it's, uh, you know, impressed me with how important it is in understanding uh, biology. So if we have two variables with a joint distribution, their correlation is best quantified by mutual information. It's positive, it's measured in bits, it counts this, this number of distinct output levels. And um, you know, in this paper, we wrote mutual information in a convenient alternative, alternate form in which what you see in the center of the expression uh, is the measured probability distribution over the output for uh, the, the range of values of input. And then um, there are various other factors. There's the probability distribution of the output integrated over everything. There's the probability distribution of the input, the bicoid concentration integrated over everything. And um, so the heart of it, the transfer function as it were, is known, that was measured. So let's just take it as a given. Uh, you have measured, but you'd like to know what, you'd like to have some principle for understanding what is the probability distribution of the expression level of hunchback. It's tied via a, um, an obvious equation, it's tied to the probability distribution of the input. So the distribution of input and the distribution of output are actually things that are, so to say, you can invert it and find one from the other. So all the quantities needed to evaluate this mutual information between this, the two players in this first uh, step are measured. Uh, there's no particular need to know why they have the forms they do for now. Gasper gave us a beautiful um, tour through a possible way to address that question. Uh, hence, we can evaluate the mutual information of G and G, between G and C from the data. And uh, Gasper, being the graduate student, did the hard work of actually doing that. And there's a number, you know, one and a half bits. So. You know, this is a quantitative statement that the fruit fly nucleus, when it's doing its first important job, is more than a simple on off switch. You know, and everybody sort of, I think, is inclined to think of these basic genetic switches as being on off, but obviously it's more than that. So the, the question that Bill uh, drove us to, to uh, address was how big could it have been given the observed noise? Okay. And uh, this setup makes it possible to essentially uh, determine what is the 
value of the input distribution or the output distribution, which maximizes this mutual information. Okay, so there's a, let's see, we click and it goes forward, great. I don't know how you go back, so I'm, I'm kind of stuck because, oops, something got- Backspace key. Backspace key, thank you so much. Uh, the backspace key, yes, ah, good. Uh, so the question was to work out the quantitative details. And again, in a classic Bill Touch, he convinced us, he, I, I would say he is in the tradition of try to write down, try to figure out approximations that allow you to get a first order yet pretty, pretty good understanding of what's going on before doing any kind of computer simulations or other such uh, annoying thing that one doesn't really want to have to do oneself. So he convinced us to solve this by using a narrow width Gaussian approximation to this core um, transfer function, the probability of G given C. So if you write that as, let's see, I guess it's not obscured on the screen, as a Gaussian where the, so to say, the width of the Gaussian depends on where you are in the input value of Bitcoin C, uh, basically a distribution about that uh, mean value with a variance, which you could have seen from measurements on the previous slide. And when you calculate the optimal value of uh, the, when you, when you optimize this, you discover that the um, distribution for the optimal input, or sorry, the optimal value of the um, uh, distribution of the output, the mean output, it's determined by the, the variance function. And okay, this is a simple um, um, standard Gaussian sort of calculation. And if you substitute this optimal value back into the expression for mutual information, you get 1.7 bits versus the actual data value of 1.5 bits. So this was, um, how shall I put it, at the qualitative level, uh, striking and interesting. And I think that was a strong motivation for the, the long march that then ensued uh, the, the arrival steps of which uh, Gasper was just telling you. And you know, there's a nice picture that comes out from that. That is to say, uh, if you look at the distribution um, of the output level, the probability of a given output level over your tens of thousands of nuclei versus the expression level, instead of getting two delta functions, one at off and one at on, you get a distribution, uh, which in detail matches rather nicely the data. The black is the data and the red is this, you know, the, the um, optimal solution according to this analysis. And you know, roughly 20% of the nuclei are neither on nor off. And this is crucial to having mutual information uh, greater than one bit. Okay, so that was that story. And that, that I think taught me that, yes, this uh, way of thinking about, um, and this way of thinking about biology in terms of probability distributions was A, interesting, B, meaningful and effective and worth uh, pursuing further. So at about that, you know, a couple of years later, we learned about uh, new experimental results in the immune system, which um, prompted us to think about this whole problem in a different, totally different context. Okay, so uh, this is the, the last paper that I, I had on our list of three. So as you all know, blood and lymph have cells that re recognize pathogens via receptor proteins on the cell surface. These receptors are staggeringly diverse and each one very specific in what it will recognize and tell the associated cell to do something about. Uh, the genes for these receptors come from random editing of the germ germline DNA. The immune cell surface receptor gene has a core sequence that varies from cell to cell and gives the cell its specificity. So, you know, if you take a human being and think of all of the T or B cells that they have, these core sequences will pr produce for you some distribution in sequence space. And 
uh, that distribution certainly is worth thinking about. Maybe it's important. Okay, with the advent of high throughput sequencing, you can get the sequences of hundreds of thousands or millions of such receptor genes drawn from a blood sample, and they can be thought of as a draw from an underlying distribution on sequence space. And we asked ourselves, can we use the new sequence data to infer this distribution? Why do we care? Well, the distribution, we learn eventually, has enormous entropy. Individual sequence probability varies widely. And in effect, every individual is a unique and different draw from this you know, probability distribution sitting in sequence space, sitting up there. And um, understanding how different immune systems all manage to protect the species from the full universe of pathogens is a statistical question at bottom. And so you better know something about this probability distribution. So our paper with Bill was the first attempt to address the problem posed this way. Uh, we used zebrafish B cell RNA seq data from Steve Quake. And this was, I think, the first attempt at mass sequencing of an immune system. 14 fish were immortalized or sacrificed their lives for this uh, purpose. And it turned out to be a good warm up for subsequent human uh, studies. The data are sequences of about 10 to the five distinct B cell receptor genes. And we focused on the amino acid sequence of the short mean length four amino acid variable part of the genes. We ignored the VJ, well, Okay, we, we ignored anything outside of that. The same sequence of, appears in the data set multiple times, varying from sequence to sequence. And we use the data to infer an explicit maximum entropy model for the probability distri distribution on sequences implied by the data. Okay, uh, now, uh, so a, a, a quick, uh, I don't know how deeply I want to go into this. How, how, do, how do cells that start, the, the immune system cells, start with the same germline DNA as every other cell in your body, yet when, they're all, when they are let loose in your, in your body, uh, they all are different. That is to say, there's some part of their uh, protein um, complement that varies from cell to cell. How does this happen? Well, this is done by something called VDJ recombination. In the germline, the, the, the actual sequence that you get in an individual cell when it's told to make a, you, know, you have a stem cell and you tell it to make a new T cell or B cell, some enzymes go to work. They pick modules that are present in the germline, bring them together, um, insert random DNA between the pieces that you've brought together, and they additionally do some chopping away at the ends of the modules that you brought together. And it's that process that produces variation. And so what we focused on basically was the sequence inside the black box. That is to say, there's a V module, there's a D module. Whoops, I went the wrong way. Um, a, a J module. And we, we start, the sequence that, the, that, that we looked at are the, the sequences that begin with the chewing away of the V module and end with the chewing away of the J module. Okay, so, um, and we write down the amino acid sequence. And in, in point of fact, the, um, this variable region is not all that long. It's, its mean length is only four amino acids. That's 12 nucleotides. So it's a, you would think, be a, a quite manageable distribution on sequences. And what did we do? Well, uh, Bill had already uh, spent much energy on understanding very diverse distributions of firing patterns of uh, neurons and had become uh, very impressed with the efficacy of the maximum entropy approach. So we simply applied a maximum entropy um, approach to this data and assuming, so maximum entropy in this case means assume the distribution is a Boltzmann form with a POTS model like Hamiltonian, where you take care of the possibility that the, um, the weight in this pseudo energy function depends on at the different 
positions in this, amino acid positions in this sequence, uh, exactly what um, amino acid you have there. And likewise depends on pairwise correlations between amino acids. And various simplifying assumptions were, uh, were made. Uh, it's the same H for all positions. It's the same J for all pairs of positions that are separated by um, K, uh, little k, uh, amino, uh, sorry, uh, yeah, little k amino acids and limit the total, the, the maximum range. We limited it to maybe four. And in truth, we only used two as its most effective, most um, significant contribution. And you can readily solve for the uh, um, maximum entropy model in this sense. And what you get is some probability distribution on these sequences. You can use, use it for many purposes. You can use it as a generative thing. And uh, the question is, well, does the model that you've so inferred correctly predict correlations that you didn't use to build the model? And uh, can you use this explicit probability distribution to generate synthetic sequence ensembles with the true statistics that are present in the data? Uh, this was a first crack at this problem, and I'll just show you one result. Uh, how well does the model describe the data? Well, the model describes assigns a probability of occurrence to any sequence. The data consists of observed sequences with occurrence numbers, and you can plot the rank frequency histogram of these sequences, and you can compare it with what you would get by drawing sequence, you know, creating a synthetic sequence ensemble from this POTS model. And so that's what's plotted here. You have a, for fish A, uh, one, one of the 14 fishes, uh, we have the observed rank frequency plot on a log-log scale. And this is a nice straight line of, you know, close to a straight line of slope one, uh, as uh, ZIPF would have it. And the, um, the model, that is to say the POTS model is by the red and the, the agreement between the observed and the model distribution uh, agree pretty nicely with each other out to a point where the, the, the data is not providing us enough data to actually uh, accurately or meaningfully measure the, uh, the frequency. Okay, so, and various things follow from this, but basically the model pretty much worked. And okay, this is good. Now, uh, the previous model that I talked to you about that was, uh, so to say, um, the prequel to Gasper's talk uh, grew up and became the thing that Gasper talked about. So this was also a primitive version of how do you address the, um, how do you address the, Whoops, how do we get this to go forward? How do you address the uh, statistical properties of the immune system? Well, we eventually learned how to do a lot better. And I'll give you a, a, a very brief synopsis of what we did to make it better. This sort of went on from Bill and took inspiration from what he taught us about the, the meaning and use of probability distributions. Um, we took sequence to be the so-called CDR3 region that is to say the full rec recognition site, it includes parts of D and J. We use the genomic DNA sequence rather than the expressed RNA sequence, because this in the end, uh, we figured out how to use that to get direct access to the probability distribution created by the VDJ recombination of action where you chew up the, uh, the germline sequence. And uh, we also learned how to get at the net effect of passing that, so to say, proto T cell through the selection events that had take place in your thymus to get the um, presumably non self interacting uh, T cells. And we took a rather different take on the probability distribution. Okay, so at this point, so at this stage, the uh, probability distribution is the probability that a given sequence that you've observed will be made in a discrete um, stem cell recombination event. And we didn't 
attempt to directly infer this probability distribution from the sequence. The idea was there was enough biochemical understanding to, to know that what happens in this germline re rearrangement is there's a series of enzymatic steps that have outcomes that are discrete, you know, maybe 10, 20 options. You don't know a priori when one of these steps occurs, what's the probability that option one, two, three, four, five, or six, seven, or eight, or nine is going to be chosen. Those are probabilities that you neither know nor measure. And the um, innovation, if you will, was simply to say, uh, let's use this, gen sorry, let's express the generative probability in terms of these unknown um, individual discrete probabilities of these events uh, and maximize the probability that you would get the actual data that you, you see, namely, you know, say 100,000 uh, T cell sequences. And uh, it turns out that maximizing over the parameters of the stochastic machine that generates the probability distribution is relatively easy to do and you get clear results. So here it is, uh, just to give you an idea. Uh, let's, here's human, here's mouse, uh, and I have mouse for a reason. Uh, the red curve, if you will, so the, um, well, there, there are different probabilities that you can think about. You can think of the probability of generating definite amino acid sequences. You can think about the probability of, uh, of generating definite nucleotide sequences and so on. So functionally, what's important is the probability of generating amino acid sequences. And what you see and what you have here is for any given sequence, there is a probability that it will have been generated in an individual stem cell event. And that number you know, ranges from 10 to the minus five to 10 to the minus 20. These are all, you know, these fit, how shall I put it? Um, that's the diversity of the uh, probability of generation of these sequences is quite enormous. And it's very different between human and mouse. Mouse is a smaller animal. This probability distribution is narrower and, um, Okay, you, I'm getting the, the hook. Okay, there are many things that you can do about, you do with this, uh, and one outcome, one thing that we eventually did was to um, make use of the fact you can generate T cell repertoires and test whether the real and synthetic sequences about how likely is it that a T cell sequence that I have will be had in some other, be found in some other individual, and uh, there's, by that time, there was data on large numbers of humans, and we could actually measure the probability of sharing of sequences between these 658 healthy individuals in the sense of they're unique. You find the, the same sequence in one other individual. You find the same sequence in two other, other individuals, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And this graphic shows you the uh, agreement between what the, the model uh, tells you and what the backspace, please, backspace, yeah, and uh, the data. And the fit is really quite remarkable. So something really good, really accurate has come out of this. And I would say the, uh, so to say, the statement about the grown-up version of the story is that uh, this pleasing statistical ensemble view of the immune system is is really important and it has, in fact, has a growing list of applications. Okay, so that's how, that's how the um, immune story grew up. And I just wanna finish with some personal uh, remarks about Bill. Uh, the best thing I did for physics at Princeton as chair was that I recruited Bill to our faculty. At that time, I felt that theoretical physics needed to pay attention to living matter, that it was a, a growth area and uh, I did it. And as a happy coincidence, molecular biology recruited Ned Widengreen at the same time. This was a partly selfish act. I wanted a colleague to help me go in that direction myself. And Bill's charisma and intellectual generosity made him the ideal choice. Once he got there, we set about building community in this new field. And 
That was interesting. Even more interesting, that worked relatively easily. What was not so easy was how to convince funding agencies to fund a group of theorists to think about biology, uh, from bacteria to brains, to use one of the, the tropes. Our proposals, while outstandingly eloquent, thanks to Bill, uh, were way outside the NIH and even the NSF box. And we had some you know, interesting uh, interactions with program directors and whatnot, but eventually the ice, you know, the, the ice jam broke. Um, and uh, another aspect was rethinking undergraduate education in science, breaking the stovepipe between quantitative disciplines in biology and Bill played a central role in developing our integrated science uh, experimental curriculum that funneled quite a number of Princeton undergraduates into this, this field. Uh, and you know, ongoing was the job of creating paths into the new discipline for, so to say, theoretical physics capable students who had never thought about biology before, developing a conversion therapy for theory geeks. And I think that was, that was done very well. And lots, lots, lots more. It's been a privilege and a blast to be Bill's colleague and friend over the past couple of de decades. Uh, happy birthday, Bill. And I, I hope for many, many more years of such friendship and collegiality and scientific adventure, uh, if not decades, I don't know. That's probably too much to ask, but many more years. Yes, please. So thank you very much. Um, should I wait for, there's still people trickling in. Okay, let's uh, start. So I'd like to thank the organizers very much for their persistence, um, for keeping Bill uh, still young. It's, it's still only 62, I think. Um, the organizers asked us to uh, present the talk kind of at the level of first year graduate students, and I, I'd like to adhere to that. Um, so uh, with that, uh, one thing that I, I promised to do, um, I also don't do the other thing, which is um, I uh, should not uh, refer to Bill's birthday in any way, and I'm, I'm not going to do that, so I will refer to him. Um, so we're here to celebrate something that happened uh, 60 years ago, right? Um, and um, it turns out I did the calculation uh, about half uh, way that time something else happened. That, that was 30 years ago. And uh, what happened then was that this event took place. Um, this is a drawing by uh, our old startup, Floor. Um, this is an airplane. Um, this left uh, uh, Holland, this is Schiphol Airport, uh, and it went to a place in New Jersey, a little greenhouse. Um, that's where we started to live. And we did that because um, Bill, uh, and we're together with um, someone who hasn't been mentioned yet, but Albert Liebschauber, they started at the NEC Research Institute uh, group in biophysics. And they invited me to come over there and um, I've had the pleasure of, of working or actually continuing my work with Bill um, ever since from that time. As you may know, uh, Bill and I met earlier about 10 years before uh, this event happened. Um, we met in Groningen where uh, Bill did his postdoc. I was a PhD student and we were having kind of a shared frustration. And that frustration was with a view uh, that was quite prevalent at the time on uh, the function and the, the, the workings of biological systems. And in particular, I was working on the nervous system of flies. Uh, and this view was that everything is very noisy. It doesn't matter uh, how accurate your experiments are. It, it's, it's all sloppy anyway. Uh, biology is not very precise. Um, both of us felt that that could really not be true. And a lot of our work was inspired by, by that idea, right? Um, and I think, to some extent, the, the symposium we have here is a testimony to the fact 
uh, that at least we were partially right in, in this. And, and it is fruitful to think about biological systems um, in terms that uh, are uh, more precise, where, where you can do quantitative experiments and real theories um, thinking about the functionality of the systems. So um, this talk is a little bit in that spirit, uh, going back to old days and to um, the efficiency of perception. And the animal we're going to use here is uh, the human, it's not the fly. Uh, and the work was done, um, actually it's the thesis work of uh, my student, uh, Corinne Deacon, at um, the Department of Physics at Indiana University. Um, so this will be about the perception of motion. I've studied motion in flies for a long time. This is now perception of motion in humans. And conventionally, we think uh, about motion as an object like an airplane going from one place to another. And uh, that, that transition takes some time. And actually, floor here, put in some clocks. There's a clock here and there's a clock there. Um, in, uh, in the Netherlands and in the USA. She was very mystified by the fact that they have a different time in the USA than in Holland. That was an interesting thing, but um, motion uh, as we commonly understand it is, is the, 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 the movement of an object or the displacement of an object from one place to another over some time. Now, what I'm gonna talk about here is something slightly different. It's, it's a bit derived from that, and that is called apparent motion. Apparent motion is not necessarily associated with an object, but it is associated with some uh, spatio-temporal correlation of uh, visual energies in this case, right? We're talking about visual information processing. And one of the earliest examples of apparent motion that was studied quantitatively uh, was by, uh, was studied by Exner uh, quite a while ago. Um, and this is now known as, uh, as phi motion, right? So you have these two bars here, those bars alternatingly uh, increase their light intensity. And if you look kind of vaguely at this, I hope you see this, you'll see some gray thing switching back and forth quite fast between these two panels, right? This is something that Exner studied um, uh, very quantitatively. So two points in space with time delayed flashes. Uh, the flashes he used were, were electrical sparks. And he, um, he derived, for example, that um, and at some reasonable distance between these two, you could get a perception of motion uh, with a, a delay between uh, the sparks, in his case, of about 15 milliseconds in that order. So we're not going to do uh, this, this phi motion. Uh, what we're going to do is a little more complicated. With the aid of computers, you can do much more complicated things. Um, and so we'll look at spatially extended stimuli, and we call that wide field. So we're, we're looking at wide field motion and we use noise patterns instead of flashes. So um, how, does, how does this work and how does this induce a, a perception of motion? Well, uh, let's, let's look at uh, this. So this is the intensity, the light intensity, if you wish, uh, at uh, positions X and Y, it's a two dimensional uh, pattern and as a function of time. And, we construct a light intensity pattern on a computer screen, and I will show you a demo, I hope it works in, in a couple of seconds, um, that is composed of a random pattern. This random pattern I naught here is a function of X, Y, and T, and it has autocorrelation that is a delta function, at least approximately, right? Everything is discrete here, but uh, we, we just write this as a, a idealized delta function. Okay. Now, uh, we multiply that uh, intensity distribution with some factor which we call the modulation depth. So um, this modulation depth will, uh, will, will be the, the uh, standard deviation of a noise, of the noise that um, you will see on, on the visual display. Mixed in with that or added to that is another pattern, which is actually this, exactly the same pattern, but it's displaced in space along X and Y and displaced in time. And so now we have a time displacement and so we have a space displacement, sorry, and we have a time lag between this one and that one, right? Both of them have this autocorrelation function. 
But if you look at the autocorrelation function of the whole of the sum of the two, you'll get this. You get back a delta function at the origin times two, uh, the two times the variance plus, and this is important in blue here, uh, a, a delta function or two delta functions, actually a pair of delta functions at two different locations that have to do with the displacement in space and uh, the time lag, right? This actually introduces a percept of motion if you look at, at this pattern and if you choose the parameters just right. So if you calculate the autocorrelation of this pattern as, as I did here, right? So uh, the, this J X, Y, T, uh, you can plot this of course in uh, now three dimensions along X, Y, and T. And you get a, a central peak, which we call the flicker peak that, that corresponds to uh, this term here. And you get these two satellite peaks, the black dots here, which correspond to those motion peaks. And those are located at uh, delta X, delta Y, delta T in space or minus delta X, minus delta Y, minus delta T, right? So I've also drawn the projections on uh, uh, the, the, the T equals zero plane, if you wish, and, and, uh, and, and the spatial plane. In the spatial plane, you can characterize the motion that you see here uh, by a direction. And that direction is given by uh, the alignment of these black dots, right? Um, the velocity of the pattern is associated with uh, the, the, uh, um, the slope of, of, of the line that you draw through those two black dots. Okay, so this is abstract, right? You compute the autocorrelation function in this way. You have I uh, and I displaced by capital X, Y, and T, and you sum, uh, if you want to calculate the autocorrelation function, you sum that thing over all little y, little x, little y, little c. Okay, standard uh, procedure calculating autocorrelation. So um, back to a little bit of physiology, it's been known for a long time that uh, animals, uh, the, that uh, the motion perception in animals can be described to some extent by what, what's known as the Weikert correlator. This was described in the early 50s, uh, the previous century already. And this Weikert correlator at its heart is basically taking two, the two uh, detectors here, photo detectors that are spatially uh, located in the visual field. They sample the visual field at two different locations, um, separated by some, uh, some uh, distance X here. Uh, you feed one through a delay, delay capital T here, and you multiply the delayed signal from one with the direct signal from the other. And this, is computing a spatial te spatial temporal correlation um, at this point if you take the average. Now, in biological systems, uh, you you so th this one would encode motion only from left to right. In a real motion sensor, you'd like uh, to encode motion both both uh, ways, and so you can make this thing anti-symmetric. It's not very fundamental, but it, this just gives you motion uh, perception in both directions. You can also, um, and this is appropriate for wide field motion that we're gonna discuss, you can take a space and time average of elements of this form, the anti-symmetric versions of this thing. And by uh, averaging over space and, and over time, you actually literally calculate the autocorrelation function uh, at, at uh, separation uh, X and time delay t. Now you can do this for different separations and different time delays if you wish, uh, but then the drawing would, be, would become very complex, but uh, it's established in the field of visual science that uh, these Reichardt models are decent uh, representations of the, the biological uh, computation that underlies motion detection. So let us try to demo this. Uh, this is always uh, exciting and, uh, and maybe heartbreaking to do a demo uh, live. So we'll see if this is gonna work. Um, what, I'm, what I'll try to do is to put up a pattern on the screen that shows these, uh, these correlations. Oh, this takes some time to kick in. Uh, shows these, uh, these, these uh, noise patterns as they're correlated 
over this distance uh, delta x and uh, space. Uh -huh. Something very interesting is happening. Well, I told you this is gonna, was gonna be heartbreaking, but, um, but it moves, right? You, you see something move, it should actually be in the center and I have no idea why it's not in the center at the moment. Um, so what you see here, oh, you can't see that. Um, there's a displacement uh, over uh, space, which is now horizontal, it's eight pixels. Delta X is eight pixels. And uh, the pattern has a certain contrast, certain standard deviation, the sigma M that I was referring to earlier. And I can change that, I can change both. So let's, let's change the Delta X. So I'm, I'm uh, producing a larger value of Delta X, which should induce in you a perception of velocity that is increasing, right? Do you see that? Who sees the motion? Can I have a show of hand? So now I'm gonna check, can you hold up your hands and let it go when you lose the motion? You lose the motion. Some people in the back still see the motion, right? So I'm going back now. Do you see the motion again? People in the back are starting to see it. And now, now the people up front are gonna see starting to see it, right? So th this is interesting, right? Uh, your visual system is, a, is an angular, has angular coordinates, right? If you're sitting up close, then uh, you see things larger than when you're sitting way in the back, right? Turns out that the, um, the motion, uh, this, this Rijkaard detector uh, that I, I just mentioned, calculates autocorrelations, but it does it over a maximum span. And if you're sitting up closer, you get that maximum span at a, a lower value of the spatial displacement than when you're sitting up further. And so that's the reason why the front half of the room at some point doesn't see motion, whereas the back half of the room will still see that, right? So I, I guess there's a, there might be a moral to this story that sometimes it's good to keep a little distance, uh, see, see things from a distance. So, in our experiment, we're also gonna change uh, the contrasts and I'll, I'll talk about exactly what uh, uh, mechanism or, or what uh, paradigm we're gonna use. And so obviously if you make the contrast low, things will get harder to see, right? And so this is a contrast of 0.1. It's getting harder to see. And the experiments we're going to do uh, will study motion perception uh, as a function of, of contrast. It's a difficult task and these are tedious experiments. Um, and I'll, uh, I, I have to thank uh, all the uh, participants in these experiments for enduring those. So um, let's get back to the presentation. Okay, so I was just mentioning this receptor field, right? So, so the, the span of these Rijkaard correlates over which you uh, seem to perceive motion. And if you, if you do the measurement uh, in, in, in a careful way, then you see that that span is about of order 15 arc minutes. 15 arc minutes is the maximum distance over which you see this type of motion. Likewise, there's a span in time and that, that span is about 70 milliseconds, right? So within this red box here, you perfectly, th this is an experiment where you, you're asked to judge the direction of motion within that red box below 15 milliseconds and below uh, about, uh, sorry, below 15 uh, arc minutes and 70 milliseconds, uh, you see motion perfectly. Outside of that box, you really see only flicker. You don't, you don't see much anymore. So um, what we're gonna do here is, is then look at, uh, an, at a specific visual task. Uh, this is not new by the way. So uh, people have gone before, uh, notably uh, Oliver Braddock and Morgan Ward and uh, a group in the Netherlands from Doorn Kundrink in Van der Grint uh, in the seventies and eighties studied uh, apparent motion with stimuli that were kind of broadly similar to what we're talking about today. 
they were uh, mainly interested in the space-time receptive fields, the one that you just show, uh, saw. Um, and uh, in our experiments, of course, we want to replicate these. And so we find, uh, fortunately, that what the receptive field we find, they just showed you, is very similar to what they found uh, uh, way back when. But what we want to do now, and this is much in the spirit of, uh, of Bill's interests, right, is to look at limits of perception in, in the sense uh, that how, to what extent can our judgment of these uh, moving patterns be uh, limited by photon shot noise, right? So in our experiments, we will do an estimation of direction of motion. And in our analysis, we will simulate the signal and noise in the autocorrelation function and extract motion direction from that by computer simulation. So this is, is the task, the experimental task. So you wanna adjust the orientation of a moving pattern. So this is kind of the, the spatial layout of pattern. You look at the cross, it's a free viewing paradigm in principle, but you're asked to look at the cross. And then this thing moves in, uh, can move in different directions. And you're asked with a mouse to manipulate the direction such that the motion is vertical. And then the whole game is to do this uh, stimulus at different contrasts, make it very hard at very low contrast and see how accurately you uh, can do this task, aligning uh, the direction of motion. So we repeat this for different contrasts and we will quantify then the standard deviation of your performance. So we measure this angle phi of the motion and you as a, as a subject can manipulate that angle and adjust it such that you get vertical motion. Of course, at every trial, you start in a random direction and you're asked to, um, to bring it in alignment. So if you do that, th these are data for, for three subjects. Uh, you plot the uh, standard deviation of the intensity modulations on the screen on the horizontal axis and the uh, sigma, the, the, your error in estimating phi on the vertical axis, you get these plots. These are three subjects. They, they uh, perform slightly differently. This is obviously the best one. Um, this is actually a current plot and uh, the other two were males. I don't know if this has anything to do. The males give up easier than females, but uh, it may also be, uh, that's more likely that she's the most trained subject here. So this is a task that you really need some training for. It's, it's not so easy. So now we wanna simulate this alignment position. And so we have to consider signal and noise also in the autocorrelation function, right? So I wrote down the autocorrelation function. If you take an autocorrelation function over infinite domains, then there's no noise in the autocorrelation function, but nothing's infinite here, right? We have a limited set of pixels and we have a limited time over which you do the task. Um, and so that means that in the intensity pattern um, that we show, uh, we will have a noise term uh, and, and that is, is uh, basically a, a term that is also uh, white noise, right? And it has some standard deviation, which we can calculate. And this is the standard deviation of the equivalent photon shot noise at the, um, the, the pixel size and uh, the frame time uh, and the viewing conditions in this experiment. All right, so, um, this term is supposed to represent photoshop noise and possibly any other noise sources uh, that, that occur in, in, this, in this task at, the, at kind of the, the, the photoreceptor level. So again, we compute the autocorrelation function over all available X, Y, and T uh, by, 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 by doing this thing. But um, because of the presence of noise, uh, the, those terms are, the, the terms in autocorrelation function are not all zero uh, on, the, uh, on the off, uh, well, there's a the couple of special points, right? But then the other points uh, have some noise in them as well. So uh, we went over this before. So the, the, the motion signal, the, the actual signal that, that will drive your perception is proportional to the number of spatial pixels. So I've collapsed NS, which is basically NX times NY in the number of spatial pixels 
and the number of temporal pixels. And it's proportional to the square of the contrast modulation, right? That's the, the height of those delta peaks, those, those off origin delta peaks in the autocorrelation function. But the noise, and that's the, the elements of the autocorrelation function that are off those peaks are, are at different locations, that has a standard deviation as well that, that you can calculate, right? That is proportional to the roots of uh, these of the number of pixels in space and time times some factor that depends both on the, the contrast modulation and on the standard deviation of the of the noise, right? Depends on a complicated way, right? Uh, so the, the standard deviation in the autocorrelation function is proportional to the square of the standard deviation of the signal that's going in. And that's because you, you're calculating a product, right? In the autocorrelation function. It's also true that uh, the noise points in the autocorrelation function space are not totally independent of each other uh, because of this uh, multiplicative uh, effect. Okay, so photon no shot noise in this task is pretty easy to calculate. Um, you have screen and you can measure the light intensity of that screen. Turns out to be 320 candela per meter squared. We know the pixel size of the screen, it's 0.4 millimeters squared. And we know the frame time, which was 8.3 milliseconds in our experiment. You sit at a distance of 1.35 meters, making one pixel equal to one arc minute. That's convenient for uh, thinking about this. Um, and the photons that are emitted from the screen hit your eye. And your eye at, in these conditions has a pupil di diameter of two millimeters. And so you, you know the whole geometry and you can calculate how many photons per second will arrive at your retina in, a, uh, the, in the projection size of one pixel, right? Per second. Um, you can, um, so you have photons per pixel per frame time and that turns out to be 231. Now, eyes have quantum efficiencies. Not all photons are absorbed. The quantum efficiency is not really well known, but uh, a, a kind of upper limit of uh, 0.25, so a quarter of the photons that reach your retina are actually, uh, or that reach your, sorry, the, the, the pupil here, are actually absorbed and, and used in visual processing. That's a reasonable number, I think. Um, if you incorporate that number in your calculations, you get an effective contrast noise standard deviation per pixel per frame time of 0.132, right? So there's 58 photons arriving per pixel per frame time in this task. Okay, now let's go back to uh, the experiment and, re and the receptive field. So uh, you calculate the autocorrelation function over all pixels and all time frames, and I've calculated here over three seconds. I, I assume that the task lasts three seconds. We have our uh, receptor field here, and this represents the receptor field in that space. What you don't want to do is to calculate the autocorrelation function over all this space, and then make an estimate of where your motion points are, because that will introduce a lot of noise points that, are, that, that will mess up your, your estimate. So it pays to have a limited receptive field to do this over, and that is represented here. Oh. So this is the receptive field. This is a blown up version. And now we're, we're talking about 15 arc minutes, right? Uh, which is the, the, the size of the receptive field and, uh, in space and 70 milliseconds, which is, uh, the, the, uh, the span of your uh, Rykert correlator in time. So to put it visually, this is what you have to do. You have to find, uh, the, somehow you have to find the points in this kind of smog, right? This smog now represents noise points in the autocorrelation function. And what we do is get an eigenvector of weighted projections of autocorrelation times values times uh, um, the coordinates and then assign the motion direction to the dominant eigenvector. If you do that in a noisy situation, uh, or half, this is a kind of mid-level mid situation. So this is the dominant eigenvector in red, and the two blue ones are the, the two others. How many minutes? Five. Five. 
Okay. Um, and as I said, we uh, are estimating the orientation of this, this vector in space. So we're estimating the angle in the xy plane of this red eigenvector. So when there's less noise, it's easier. When there's more noise, it's harder, right? And you can actually uh, plot uh, the, the simulation, you get the red line. And that red line uh, is compared here to the experiments. Uh, and it is really, really very close. And it's so close, I, I think, to be scary. Now, this was, uh, of course, our best subject. Uh, the other subjects are, are a little worse, but not, not terribly so. Um, if this is true, right, then, then it means that, that you can do this task with almost, uh, well, almost perfectly given the fact that you have to work with uh, real photons that arrive at random, right? Um, so to summarize this, um, we, we, in, in our simulation, what we did is we estimate photon shot noise, assuming 25% quantum efficiency. This is a fairly good number, but it's, it's not terribly hard. We calculate the uh, autocorrelation function over the full number of pixels and over a substantial time, three seconds. Now, the, the task, um, especially for the low contrast, took people about uh, five to eight seconds to do on average. Right, so I don't know if this three seconds is a good estimation of your internal integration time over, over which you integrate the percept of motion. But it's, it's kind, of, kind of a substantially long time. Um, so we model uh, the, the motion estimation as the direction of the dominant eigenvector, and we do this as a form of contrast. Uh, the psychophysical task, we do this motion estimation. Um, and we quantify that as a number uh, as a factor of contrast, and we see that they are really very close. So the performance of the best subject is very close to, to simulated performance, and there's not much room, I would argue, to improve the simulated performance, except you will always have to uh, ha have to be cautious that you're not missing something. So it's quite possible that we're missing something here, but I, I think it's, uh, it's very close. It's unbelievably close. Um, and I invite all you theorists in the room uh, to uh, argue with me um, about maybe what, what, what we're missing. So we were in London last week and uh, we came uh, close to our hotel. It was this pub and it's the best pub in London. And you can come in and argue and I will buy you a beer. Thank you very much. So Rob, we worked together on, on, the, on the fly visual system. And what I remember of the, the Reichardt um, correlator, one of the predictions that is counterintuitive is that at low signals noise ratio, at low contrast, the response, the perceived vision is quadratic in the, um, in the contrast right. that, that, that we saw in flies. Can yep. you see that in humans? Strangely enough, we, we haven't seen, we, we thought that, right? So we did experiments where you compare a real mo motion pattern, right? A noisy pattern that, that moves not in apparent motion, but in real motion to these patterns and to the, the even the lowest uh, contrast we could use in those experiments, we find that there's a one-to-one -one motion match. Hmm. So we didn't find a clear signature of the fact that these Reichert correlators are quadratic in contrast. So, so maybe in humans, they divide by the overall contrast or something like that. Yeah, so there's, of course, a signal to noise ratio issue here. And, mm. and maybe um, these experiments were not done at the, in, in the regime where you would expect it. But we were kind of surprised that that didn't work. Yeah. Thanks. Yeah. That was a great talk. Um, uh, similar to the last question, remember the old days when you would do similar kinds of uh, very cleverly designed statistical um, visual stimuli, right? That have just the statistics you want. You've, in this case, you know, you're, just a few delta functions captures what's going on, the right. correlations. But it's a pretty unnatural stimulus. It is. It is. And so yeah. what, what I wonder is if you do the same experiment um, with, you know, whatever. Take frozen noise, 
move it, you know, translate it, and then add noise on top. That's artificial as well, but it's closer, I think, to the sort of stimulus, except maybe in the low single to noise ratio. Yeah. If you add enough noise to what you're doing, it's going to be the same. But, yeah. but for the case when you don't add noise to it, I mean, how does that, have you looked at that with people and do they perform? The thing is your people are performing so well, mm-hmm. maybe it's not going to matter, but I wonder, do you see changes in their performance? Well, so um, for a, a real motion, right, which, which is a moving object, things are much harder to calculate. And that's because there's basically a, a correlation over infinite, infinite spans, right? And so we realized at some point that, that these apparent motion stimuli were kind of very suitable for asking this question because it, it makes the analysis much more crisp, right? It, it, it's easier to, uh, um, and, and that's because you, you can't, you, in normal motion as we think about it, you have an object that, that moves, right? And, and you can make a correlation from arbitrary points in time uh, that are arbitrarily far apart. It's true, but you could still fully control it. You know, you can make an artificial, you don't need to take movies of the real world. And that's really hard in other statistics, mm-hmm. but if but you can hard, but... invent, yeah. anyway, uh, just curious if you looked at it, but yeah, Frank, yeah. thanks. Yep. Thanks. Maybe I have a last question yeah. for the people who do worse. Is it because the internal circuitry is somehow worse or is it because they're not trained enough or not paying attention? I think it's the letter. That, that, that's, that's what I suspect that it, it takes a long time for subjects to get this task right. And, and, and especially the, the perceptual end, the, the motor end is, is fine, but uh, to perceive these, it, it helps to be overtrained. And Karen, uh, who was, had the best curve, is, is clearly the one who saw by far the most motion.